everyone, a very warm welcome back to The Doctor Will See You Now. Well, as ever, criminal treats. Um, and as you've often heard me say, if you've watched or listened to, to the channel before, sometimes it takes a publisher or a publicist to bring to the doctor's knowledge um, a text that she really should have just gone out and found herself. But there's so many books and so little time. I'm sure readers or, 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 or listeners of audiobooks that you know what it's like. How do you make a choice? And I'm just really glad that sometimes the choice is made for me. And that is so with the novel that we're going to be discussing today. The novel is The Mysterious Case of the Alberton Angels, published by Viper uh, in January 2023. The Have With Us, the most fabulous author, Janice Hallett. Janice, thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a delight to be here. I, do you know, there's just that sense of there's an author's name that you wish you could get, you know, you could talk to that author and ask them so many questions. And 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 now is that moment where for me that's that's happened. So I'm I'm really grateful uh, for the fact that you're here and this has been made possible. Oh, how sweet. Far away. <laughs> yeah, now I know um, from reading your bio, I know that crime writing um was not uh your first uh, foray into writing whatsoever if people you know take time to have a look at your bio uh, you are a magazine you are a magazine editor an award-winning journalist you've worked in government communications um you you know you've traveled around the world with this uh, I, I looked at places you've traveled to as most envious madagascar galapagos guatemala zimbabwe and so on um and then i saw um, you know, you've been a playwright and a screenwriter. So I wondered, from all that beautiful, vast writing experience, what brought a writer like you into this grimy world of crime fiction? And <laughs> what influence of your former writing can we find within the pages of your novels? Well, I would say absolutely everything I've done, every um, trip I've taken, every job I've had, every person I've known is going into these books. It's a, a really, a, writing a novel is a very intense experience. And I think, like it or not, you draw on everything in your life. And even knowingly, I think every form of writing I've done before now is, is being employed in all of these novels, right from editing uh, the trade magazines, which is what I did for the first 15 years of my career, um, to playwriting and screenwriting, which I then um, went on to learn how to do and and worked um, for a relatively short time uh, doing. Um, you know, all of that um, has led to this moment. And I think that I only really made the, the leap from screenwriting to novel writing when the screenwriting had sort of hit a dry patch. And I really wasn't getting um, where I wanted to be at all. And that's when I switched to see if doing something different would get me a different result, um, which explains if you've read my first novel, The Appeal, I think it explains why dialogue is so important in that particular novel, because I, I come from script writing, where dialogue is all important in developing and, and delivering character. So, yeah, I would say absolutely everything is influencing this this moment. Something that you said that struck me, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful word of encouragement, you know, to all of us, wherever we're at in our life, whatever we're doing, but particularly if we are considering writing or we're already writing, that idea of if if a certain avenue suddenly seems to come to an end, then try and shift, you know, the focus, uh, just, you know, move a little bit, you know, so going from, from that script writing, screenwriting, it's not happening I'll try this and 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 if we might say so you know I'll give this a go and there we have it you know a best-selling author the appeal that you mentioned it's a Sunday Times bestseller Waterstones Thriller of the Month the winner of the CWA New Blood Dagger so it's interesting isn't it that shift um, yeah. you know and what that brings uh, you know and, and and I should mention Sunday Times Crime Book of the Year 
Uh, and then the, the second novel, Twyford Code, uh, again, another bestseller. Um, so th- I, I, I'm just thrilled by the notion that a shift uh, can lead um, to, to new, successful, uh, enjoyable pastures. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm the living uh, example of that. If you if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you've got. So I spent a good five, six years trying to get into TV script writing. And I was writing spec script after spec script and just not getting anywhere. And really, it's a lesson I should have learned a little bit earlier. Um, but hey, you know, it, things happen at particular times for particular reasons. Indeed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in, in, in relation uh, to the mysterious case of the Alberton Angels. Um, but before we get into uh, the Doctor sort of like going deep and, 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 and delving into that novel, we should talk about something else first uh, that I'm absolutely intrigued about. Um, that um, you have been uh, the guest curator uh, for, for January on Love My Read. Um, and Love My Read, uh, they provide a bespoke book subscription. Uh, and so you got to choose the January text. But please tell us about that experience. And then if you would tell us about the novels that you chose and why. Oh, absolutely. I'm picking uh, novels for, or books, as it turns out, so well, only uh, two of them are novels. Uh, picking those books for Love My Read was such a privilege because when you suggest books to people, when you give books to people uh, for, as gifts or suggest people or even lend them, you're opening up a new horizon for that person. And it, it's such a privilege and it's such a joy. So I really gave a lot of thought to the books that I was going to recommend to people. And I wanted them each to have a, a purpose to them and a purpose for me and a purpose for the people uh, reading them. So shall I, shall I go on and uh, explain the ones that I, I chose and why? That would be wonderful. Please do go ahead, yeah. Right. Well, the first one, now that I, I've just at the... Um, the curated Love My Read uh, box coincided with the launch of uh, The Mysterious Case of the Alperton Angels, which has a true crime theme to it. Uh, So I thought I wanted to put a really good true crime book in there. And my opinion, uh, the best true crime book published last year was The Hunt for the Silver Killer by David Collins. Now, David Collins is, um, I think he's currently Northern Editor for for The Times, and um, he has been a a crime reporter. And I came across him uh, in my research for The Alberton Angels because he's um, he he was quite intrepid, let's say, um, when he was a crime reporter. And I was very inspired by that for for what my characters get up to. So we had a chat and he was uh, writing The Hunt for the Silver Killer at the time. And I was lucky enough to receive an advanced copy of it to read. As true crime goes, it's pretty much as horrifying as it gets because it's um, he's not talking about um, a cold case. He's not talking about um, uh, crimes that have been investigated by the police. These are crimes that have not even been um, deemed to be murders because the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator is so clever and so um, forensically aware that his crimes have been passed off as murder suicides. He's killed elderly couples in the northwest of England. And these, um, it's only thanks to a couple of coroner's officers who have flagged up certain anomalies and things that should have been looked into. Not all of them are even now are accepted as murders. So um, it's, it's worth reading that book to, to see how I mean, we're very well versed in these serial killers who have been caught. But what about the ones over across the years who haven't been caught? And this one's still at large. So The Hunt for the Silver Killer by David Collins is um, a fabulous read. Thank yeah. you. I, I, <laughs> that's that, that one. That was news to me. And, and yeah. that, that's going to be ordered when, when we finish uh, our conversation. Thank you. Thank you Brilliant. <laughs> well, my next, uh, for, the other, for the next two, um, I wanted to choose a, a contemporary crime novel, one that's really um, spoken to me. And it was Runtime by Catherine Ryan Howard. And I have Runtime, it's about, um, briefly, it's about a, an actor, a female actor on a film set, a very remote film set in a forest. And she pretty soon after arriving at this spooky um, 
upset. She realizes things are not quite right. And she ends up um, running for her life around uh, this set and escaping a killer. Um, that description doesn't do justice to the humour and the really lively writing in this. Uh, if you're familiar with Catherine Ryan Howard's writing, she is a real, um, I, I, like, I describe this novel as a mixture of The Blair Witch Project and Fleabag, because she's a, a really fabulous, um, lively, funny writer. And I think if you can write something that makes you laugh, but also makes you tense and <gasps> builds up the, the tension that's a real skill because usually the two cancel each other out you don't uh, you can't have much laughter in a, a novel that's very tense normally unless you're very skillful and uh, Catherine Ryan Howard does so I'd recommend Runtime as, uh, as a good contemporary crime read. Now my third book I wanted to, to pick a, a more classic a classic novel that's meant something to me. And at first glance, uh, this one won't appear to have influenced my writing very much, and yet it has. Um, and I've chosen Room by Emma Donoghue. It was published, I think, about 10 years ago and made into a film subsequently, uh, starring Brie Larson, brilliant film as well. Um, and Room is told from the point of view of um, Jack, who's five years old. And he, he tells the story of... Um, he lives with his mum and he tells his, his life story, really. He lives with his mum in room. And that's really all you need to know, because, you know, let's uh, let that story unfold for you because it's so wonderful. Um, but and at first glance, that um, doesn't appear to be a crime novel, but it is. And at first glance, you wouldn't think there was anything, any connection between um, this particular work and my own. But while I write my work, I often think back to this narrative told by a five-year-old boy, because my novels are all told by people who are not conventionally, conventionally um, articulate. Mm. They're by ordinary, normal people. They're not literary people. It's not a literary narrator. And that's the case for Room. And I often thought back to that five-year-old narrator while I was writing The Appeal, my first novel, and I was thinking, will people want to read? a novel written by ordinary people or through the told through the voice of ordinary people. And then I thought, yes, because Room was so wonderful and so brilliant. So it's been more of an influence on me, me than it might appear. Um, but I'd highly recommend the, the novel and, and in fact the film. So, um, yeah, the, those those three novels have um, really stood out to me while I was recommending the Love My Read uh, reads. And goodness, I hope people who receive them um, think the same. Janice, I, I'm just struck by, by two things here. First of all, um, the, the premise of Love My Read, the idea of putting together a set of books that mean, you know, something to the author that, that is, you know, that is making that selection. But then why, why you, you know, why you would like people to read them. Um, and and I, I think it's yeah. What a, what a beautiful, um, you know, way of passing on books books that that mean something to an author. I have I have no doubt whatsoever that the 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 the, the lucky people who take that subscription uh, will have very much enjoyed uh, January's recommendations from yourself. Thank you, thank you for thank you. that. Um, ah, so I suppose we should, shouldn't we? We should delve, though. You've been very generous in the way you've talked about other people's writings. Um, but I do think we should uh, now focus on you, if that's OK. Put you under the spotlight. <laughs> it would be a pleasure. If I can remember, <laughs> remember things. I can often remember. The problem, isn't it? You know, yeah. I, you, when I get to interview authors, the, you know, the book is, for them, the book is long gone. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's strange, yeah. 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 I really have to think to remember my own plots. It is funny. It's and it's similar with other authors as well, having spoken to them about it. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, and, and I, I always think that's really tricky, um, because again, talking about books and and you know, wanting readers and listeners to get the most and not give too much away, but but drop those breadcrumbs that make people think, I've got to, I've got to get into that, and and I, I think. Uh, with the mysterious case of the Alberton Angels. Um, I think that idea of drawing people in, I know when we were talking beforehand, I felt very much that you invite 
the reader also to be the investigator um and as opposed to watching it unfold uh, there's a sense of you know being part of that um and and thank you thank you for your style of writing uh, and the experience that brings but tell us now why you know what is what, what is this novel about um you know who are the alperton angels well, let me describe that plot. Uh, I had, I do have it up, uppermost in my mind at the moment, so hopefully I'll remember it. Or well, I might have to go back and, and you know, clarify a few things because uh, it's it's quite um, it's labyrinthine. The mm. plot. There's a lot going on in this particular book. Yeah, yeah. If, if you'll just permit me, if we if we should. So, yeah, you know, this this is a book that it, it it we could say it's weighty. However, I would also say. Readers, listeners, despite its size, shall we say, it flows so beautifully and you will be lost in this and you you will forget time and space as you work through it. Anyway, I, f- forgive me, Janice, back to you. Oh, no problem at all. Well, um, The Mysterious Case of the Alberton Angels. Uh, it's about two... Uh, true crime authors who are racing each other to a key interviewee Um, and the interviewee um, was a baby 18 years ago when a cult called the Alperton Angels uh, deemed them to be the Antichrist and um, almost sacrificed them. Now luckily uh, the baby's teenage parents escaped and all three um, disappeared into the care system But now, of course, that baby is an adult and can be interviewed as such. And uh, Amanda Bailey, my my main character, she's a true crime author, um, is locked in competition with her rival, her nemesis called Oliver. And um, he's that they have a lot of history between them, which unfolds as we read the book. But uh, nonetheless, they're forced to work together on this and um, they both want the scoop. So that it's kind of it's not that they don't get on, but they're they're quite antagonistic towards each other. only the more they dig into this old case, the less seems to add up. And uh, Amanda and Oliver must find out what really happened back then while avoiding falling prey to the very powerful ethos of this um, cult at the time. Um, And I should say also, we start the book with uh, a a dilemma, a question. There's a question at the beginning. And it says, you you have a bundle of research material from a safe deposit box. And it's um, research material for Amanda's book. Uh, So we have her interviews, uh, transcriptions, her WhatsApp messages, her texts, her notes, her little scripts that she writes as she's calling people to interview them. We have have all sorts of things that she's put together, as well as various fictional um, accounts of this cult that has inspired a great deal of various other um, playwrights, film writers and, and novelists over the years. So we have all of this bundled together. We have to read it and decide what to do. Um, we may wonder why we don't have the book and we just have the research material, um, but we have to decide what to do with it. And that's either go to the police, take it all to the police and expose whatever might be in there or put it all back and throw away the key. And so we have to make a decision at the end. So, uh, yeah, I hope readers enjoy um, getting to the bottom of it. Yeah, I, I and it, it, even you know that you say that 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 idea of do you do something with this or because of you know the evil that there is, uh, it, it sh- should we go back and visit these things if it's over? And and for me, you know, the book we'll talk a little bit about this. The book poses a number of moral dilemmas of you know behavior and choices um and and i very much appreciated um you know those questions being posed about why we do what we do how we go about you know the way we do uh, about things but let's let's just stay with amanda uh for a moment and and i wonder if you could do a little thing around amanda if you could talk to us about her strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> well, Amanda, her, her strength is her absolute commitment to the story and her ruthless focus on getting what she wants from it, on getting to the truth. 
And that ruthless focus um, inspires her to behave in a very immoral way uh, at various points. And she'll record things and say she's not recording them. She'll lie about who she is and what she wants um, in order to get to the truth. So we're quite conflicted, I think, over her, um, her well, I suppose over her character generally. Um, but as the, as the novel goes on, we see that she's, we see why she's like she is because she has a particular background and she's had to survive um, on her own uh, at various points in her life. And she's been vulnerable herself and she's been um, taken advantage of herself in her life. So we can see where that ruthlessness comes from and um, how it affects her negatively. I think later on, we, we see her confiding in, in um, an old friend. And uh, so I, mean, I love Amanda, but she's, she's an anti-hero as well as a hero. Yes. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Now you mentioned, of course, that bundle uh, and documents and, and notes and the novel itself is is structured thus um you know we see emails uh, we see post-its um you know lots of different writing styles uh, that you've brought together and i love that um because it, you know as i said it, it keeps me moving through through the text but i wondered for yourself as the person who's put this together did you know before you set off the different styles that you'd use for different pieces of information uh, and you know the whole thing of fitting this together so that whilst it may look like you know hodgepodge of various things it's not at all i think did i know i yes i probably did know because i'd written the appeal and i'd written the twyford code uh, this was the first novel i wrote after having been published, whereas the other two I wrote before I'd ever been a published author. Uh, and I had this idea that I wanted to employ everything I'd learned writing those first two and put it all into the third. And I, I guess if you look at, if you read them in sequence, you'll see that that does actually happen. I've got the emails and texts from the appeal and I've got transcripts, which is the Twyford code is all um, audio transcripts. And there's a whole mixture in this, as well as more, more stuff like you say, there's um, a, a YA novel, there's a, a film script, unproduced film, and um, a kind of airport novel, a uh, very a sort of salacious uh, kind of page turning read in there too. So yeah, I, 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 I was aware that I wanted to do something different. I think that's always my aim to, when I start a new novel is to do something different from the previous book and to experiment and explore and learn more about it. And I think everything I've done so far has been experimental. Mm. And uh, that comes, uh, comes across here. Yeah, and, and I, you know, and it's then, you know, I'm, you know, I'm passionate about crime fiction, but it's one of the things that I love about it, that it lends itself to this kind of experimentation. You know, that, that it's, it's so, you know, the, the elasticity, shall we say, or the dimensions that can be found therein, but and but not but not every author is, shall we say, brave enough in a way to try that. Um, and and again, I just want to say to you, thank you. You know, for for finding that that style that is different and that you know clearly clearly works for you, but but you know, in, in making that nice change for us, the readers, as well. Well, thank you very much. I have to say, um, I've thought about writing a third-person narrative, a more conventional narrative, and I haven't ruled it out at all. I mean, I'm sure I will at some point. But it does, um, I feel quite trepidatious about it. There's, uh, there's some trepidation there, because I haven't done, written a full novel like that before. So I suppose while other authors might be a bit scared to write this kind of novel, yes. Yes. it goes the other way as well. I, I'm a little bit nervous. Of, uh, of that third person narrative myself thank you for sharing that you know that that, that sense of you know again which path do I choose to write mm -hmm. like, how do I get my story across um and I suppose you know what, what what sits you know most comfortably doesn't necessarily do so for other authors 
But if we could turn now to, you know, I, I mentioned our fascination with crime, uh, fiction, fact, true crime in particular. Mm -hmm. um, why, I mean, in, in your own research, and, 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 and does you, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I, in fact, didn't have to do a whole lot of true crime research for this novel because I love it so much anyway and have done for as long as I can remember. I mean, uh, I'll pretty much read any true crime book and watch any documentary and film about anything, even even uh, crimes that I've I've seen a hundred things about, yeah, yeah. Uh, just in, in case I, I can see something new or something different, or someone has a, a new theory that takes me down a new road. I find it so exciting and so thrilling, which is, but it's something I struggle with too, because of course it's reality for, for people. You know, these things really happen. And so, you know, I, I love it yet. I hate myself for loving it. Um, and that's, that's another sort of tangled emotional, um, you know, tangle that, that comes out through the book. I think that um, we do have this dilemma with true crime. I mean, I, if you look at it in the cold light of day, our fascination with crime, especially true crime, but, but crime fiction too, is all um, a bid to feel safe, to understand crime and what leads to crime, what, what leads to someone being a perpetrator, what leads to someone being a victim in order so we can keep ourselves safe. And I think that's what's behind it, even if we don't feel I think it's all subconscious that we don't realize but that's why we are so fascinated by it um, but still you know there's it can be voyeuristic it can be prurient um, we have to be careful we have to always be mindful that there are real victims there um, so yeah it's, it's a dilemma I mean I still have the dilemma even having written the book um, but yeah it's, it's I think it's a good dilemma to be aware of yeah, yeah, very much indeed, because I, yeah, I mentioned at the beginning when we started talking, how I felt that the book posed some of those questions. Yeah, I was thinking that, you know, the, you know, investigative journalism, you know, and, and you know, how, how that work evolves, you know, and, and looking at, at those very delicate, difficult subjects and, and the thought of people making a living Mm -hmm. of these very painful incidents um and and how to do so in a in a respectful way um and i, I you know some sometimes um it, it felt a little bit uncomfortable mm -hmm. you know people's responses in the emails the back and forth um mm -hmm. but it, you know it was like seeing the you know like the, the the unsanitized version in a way absolutely i mean i see um i see it perhaps the way um a police um, officer may see it. I mean, they have to investigate the crime and they are emotionally motivated to do it, but they have to put that emotion aside in order to investigate it fully. I think journalists do the same, but that that um, dissociation from the emotion can come across as um, dismissive and flippant. Um, so it's, I mean, it's something perhaps they should be aware of or we should be aware of um, as in, in that um industry ourselves or myself um so yeah it's i, I see it I, I can see why but i i'm really aware of it at the same time so i'm still conflicted here even today yeah 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 um, I, you're talking about being flippant and, and i hope this question doesn't come across as flippant but but early on in the book there's mention from some newspaper clippings uh, uh, and, and a wee heading that says the stars align and it talks about various things that happened around the time of, of, of the murders uh, and the, the you know the, the planetary configuration at that time and I just wondered with you bringing that in um, whether you you know uh, you know you, you feel that the movement of the planets influence our lives our destinies or was this just something that you, you know, having a slight bit of humour, if we can call it humour, into into the novel? I don't know. I'm interested in everything and in anyone's beliefs. I'm I'm certainly um, a believer in possibility, mm -hmm. and um, and I have to add the caveat that I'm a typical Capricorn. So, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe there is something in the alignment of the planets. That's a genuine alignment, by the way, that happened uh, then. I did do, do some research into that um, when I was looking for a, a time for these 
um, events to have happened. Uh, but yeah, I find it very interesting. And that there's a lot of very compelling um, belief systems that are explored in, in here. They, they all exist, they're, they're not ones that I made up. Yes. Uh, they're all pe ones that people believe in. Um, and I find they're very compelling. You know, it's very, it's good. To, I would love to think that there's a, an overriding force for good that is um, influencing us here on earth. Um, that would be great, wouldn't it? It really um, would, especially in the face of so much darkness um, mm. that exists out with the pages. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And to think that darkness had a purpose. is It's a very powerful ideology. Um, I would love it to be true. One day we may discover <laughs> who knows but can i just break in and say hello fellow capricorn i too am oh you're a fellow you're capricorn too yeah. hello yeah uh, are you an early capricorn or a mid capricorn or a late capricorn uh, i'm the 14th so i suppose i'm moving okay. towards the end towards yeah. the end yeah i'm the second of january right so you're, you're yeah. in the is it in the middle then i'm right in the middle really yeah yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah anyway, we, anyway yeah <laughs> we could go on couldn't we we could, we could but we won't because we, won't, because we are perfectionists as capital, so we, we are yeah yeah um coming back then you you, you said that you, you know you found out you know that this there was actually an alignment and this brings me to ask <laughs> you um the research that you did for this book mm -hmm. you know between the fact and fiction there was a lot of factual research that you did around cults um mm -hmm. things like that and, and I wondered, was there, and this is going to be hard to say, was there one aspect of this research that just left you stunned? It certainly stunned me when I, I looked around for a cult that was after killing the Antichrist and found a myriad of cults that were after doing that. Um, yeah, the, I mean, I although I'd already read a lot about uh, cults that we've you know heard about over the years mm -hmm. they never cease to shock me what people um what what people are led to believe in when they're vulnerable yes. uh, because that's something that that came across it's not um strange people who become enmeshed in a cult we could all become enmeshed in a cult we could all be preyed upon by a cult leader when we're at a vulnerable state in our lives mm -hmm. um and that that came across. It's something that is is um, talked about a lot in the book, because uh, that's um, a, ma a major part of my research was looking into why people um, follow cults, why why they follow cult leaders, and and also I, I looked into why they start cults, what what leads people to do that. Because I had to create a cult leader yes. in Gabriel Angelis in here. Um, so yeah, that, looking at that was quite shocking, and it is shocking to think that. You're lucky if you haven't met that predator who's who's got you in mesh because a cult doesn't have to be a big organization. It can be just one person, one person and, you know, a, co a coercive um, relationship, exactly. toxic relationships yeah. are very, very similar. And a cult is really just a coercive relationship on a grand scale. Yeah. Um, and that's it's worth bearing in mind. It's worth knowing that you can be vulnerable and to work out when those vulnerable times are. Yeah, yeah, I th thank you. At that point, I think is so important, you know, that you raise. We, when we think of cults, it is usually, you know, those, you know, larger scale groups that, you know, who hit the headlines uh, as opposed to what actually might be happening in our own lives uh, yeah. on a much smaller scale. Yeah. Mm. There was another aspect of the book as well that, um, I'm very wary of how we should approach this because I'm aware of, you know, all the hard work that people do and how difficult it is with the amount of work that people have. But you touch on um, the social work system uh, and, and how that can affect, you know, what happens to people or what doesn't happen to people. Um, in bringing this aspect of, of our you know, society in, were you aware of being careful with that as well, of how you presented things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the my research into the care system is something that I made a priority, oh. um, really, because, because I have no ex uh, personal experience of it at all myself. So without that lived experience, I, I felt a real um, 
uh, obligation to represent as far as I was going to represent it to represent it accurately and to be fair so I spoke to um, through various friends people who'd, who'd been social workers um, people who had worked in child protection and people who had grown up in care and I was very careful to um, look for people who'd worked in similar areas and at similar times to the characters I had because of course things change very quickly um, so yeah I, and although it's, it's one of those things you, you never feel you've done it properly you never feel you've, you've fulfilled that task it's one of those things I hope um, I've done my best with it I mean I took um, some of the things people said and have incorporated those things in the book and I hope through that it gives them a voice through this book um, it's because it, you know it's in, it's interesting I asked the people um, who'd been in care to tell me the worst things that happened to them if they were happy to do so and and the best things about that experience and they they had they all had best things you know as well as bad experiences they'd had good ones too and their stories weren't the worst that you could ever hear but they each had a story I mean there are as many stories um, as there are people who've grown up in care or have had experience of the care system and um, I think they're all valuable and um, it's one of those things I mean I I, I've researched these things as much as I possibly can, but I never feel I've done it justice. Um, but I do my best. It's tricky, isn't it? Because there mm. has to come a point where you have to stop. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't progress the work. Um, but but uh, you know, I will say I think there's you know, and, and you acknowledge this in, in you know in, in the acknowledgements at the back of the book, um, that sense of allowing those voices. And, and mm -hmm. for me, again, it's one of those fabulous aspects of crime fiction you know the allowing the unheard voices to be heard yeah oh absolutely and to create for the reader an an emotional environment to experience what they may have experienced um it's something you don't get so much in in true accounts um that's the the privilege really of the of the novelist yes um, if we stay in the acknowledgements just for a moment, um, you, you know, you thank people so beautifully, but there's there's two people that I'd like to mention, uh, both journalists. We've already talked about David <laughs> Collins and, and yep. his work there, uh, and James Brockett. And you, you know, you, you, you know, you, you acknowledge the the help and support uh, from, from 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 these two journalists. And I just wondered if you could summarize in a way the the times that you had with them in talking through um you know your writing and your preparation for for the novel well it's it's an interesting uh, fact i i thought of james because i knew him around the same time the events happen in the book i knew he worked on a local paper now the book is is set in the area i live so he was the the ideal person for me to go to and i think it says something about how um local journalism has changed over the years and that he no longer works um as a, a journalist he he works in marketing i believe um because and this is another um factor that i talk about in the book the local news gathering is now completely different yeah. and it has really declined in in volume i mean it's all online uh, you don't get the roving local reporters so much anymore and uh, amanda and oliver the two main characters they've come from that background so their um instincts are now applied to true crime uh, books rather than local news gathering but they have to go back to a time where they were working in local news and they uh, did, you know, have to look back at their their local stringer who was a a roving reporter that's uh, since died and they look back to his work um, and James was was fabulous in recreating that that time and uh, the, the shortcuts people took then the funny things that happened um, you know the things that, that uh, and how well you get to know the local area when you're working around it um, so yeah that was it was very very valuable and it was interesting to talk to those two journalists uh, James who'd been very local and David very um, sort of national news and really proper national if not international um stories um <laughs> so uh yeah no i uh, i really enjoyed that and having been a journalist myself albeit not in current affairs um the the industry where i worked was magazines uh, trade magazines and that too has declined thanks to the internet and the changing way we consume news and, and information so it's interesting to quite nostalgic really to go back to a time when um 
you actually created a paper or, or a magazine and people bought that that paper for the news yeah so, yeah. yeah yeah and those days are gone sadly sadly mm. but but i think again to to recall and and celebrate and and i think for me you know the, the collaboration that you are speaking of, you know, that, that, that happened, you know, with with these individuals. And, and that really encourages me. I, you know, I, I have other friends who, who work in newspapers who lament, you know, the way things evolve. Um, but looking back at good stuff, I think, is a way to remember. Now... Janice, I'm very conscious of the time, and and I, I am aware that I could be monopolising, you know, <laughs> your, your your very valuable and precious time. So I've just got a couple more questions, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and so I, it's one that I often ask because, again, just to dig deep into how this, you know, how this beautiful work, you know, we get to enjoy it in its glorious state, but along the way. There are surely struggles and and moments of oh, really um and so I wonder you know if, if or maybe not maybe this book behaved beautifully um, <laughs> but I just wonder if you if there were a moment that you know, something like a you know a headache along the way where you got extremely frustrated with it and thought well I'm not sure about this. <laughs> Um, I don't think there was ever quite that moment. I mean, there was all, it was always nagging at me what I was saying before about representing the care system and people who'd come through it accurately and certainly, um, you know, respectfully doing that. That was always a, a worry to me. But as for the structure and the writing of the novel, um, once I get to the end of that first draft, it's always a big rewrite. Okay. Always, because of the way that I write, I don't plan things in advance. So what I end up with at the end of that first draft is like three, four, five, maybe separate novels all stuck together. And I have to go go back and make them all one flowing narrative. Uh, so that's always a really big moment and a big rewrite. And that's um, it's where you have to hold your nerve, really, but particularly after my editor has given me notes and I've got another big rewrite. Mm -hmm you have to then break down the narrative, the text that you've got. And for a long time, you've broken it down. You don't have a novel anymore. And that can be quite scary because as a, as a writer, you're always focusing on that word count and on having that finished text. And when you break it down, it's like you're at that stage, you've broken the eggs and you've got lots of broken eggs, but no omelette. Yeah. And, yeah. and so you have, to, yeah, a... yeah, you have to hold your nerve yeah. while you're waiting to cook it, cook that omelette. Um, and that can be that's always quite nerve wracking because you think, will it fit together again? Will I get, you know, will I get this back together in a, in a great way, in a way that's better than before? So that's always it's a big driver as well, though. So that's what that fear motivates, motivates me anyway, to get that back into shape. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I love every step of the, the creative process, uh, creating a novel. Um, so I, just, I, I try not to worry about things, try not to make get things that are stressful because i find that stops me writing and stops me stops the flow of creativity yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah i try and chill about it just yeah just go with it Let go it with go. the flow yeah yeah <laughs> so for my last question because I mean, we mentioned earlier on that you know you put this novel to bed quite a while ago mm -hmm. um and so um, whilst we're here you know to celebrate that i wonder if we're if we allowed to ask what you might be working on at the moment. Ah, oh, yes, you can ask. Yes, definitely. Well, um, very excitingly, I have another book out in October Ooh. and it's called The Christmas Appeal. And it's a, a novella, a short, uh, shorter, slightly shorter book um, that looks at the fairway players who have now moved on um, a few years um, since the events of the appeal. So we're looking at the same, some of the same characters yeah, um, yeah. who were in the appeal. They've moved on. Um, and the, the group is putting on a pantomime for Christmas. Uh, only there's um, there's a murder. There, there's a body. And um, <laughs> our, our uh, young lawyers, who've also moved on in their lives, they're now working, um, Femi and Charlotte, um, are approached again by their mentor, uh, Roderick Tanner, and he asks them, can they get to the bottom of this murder? So uh, that's a Christmas novel, a Christmas appeal, it's called. Excellent. So that... <laughs> So we don't have to wait too long. Not too long. Then I've got another full, 
full length novel coming out 2024 and that's called The Examiner. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I, you know, I, I hate to put pressure on authors, you know, but that sense of if we, you know, we delight so much in what you do. So, you know, if, if there's more to be had, yeah. And, and we're delighted to, uh, to, to, you know, to do it, to write it. I, well, I love it anyway. I, I love writing. I I I, re I get the sense of that, and 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 you know, I know I think as well within the pages, um, even if even if it's you know it's it's dark stuff. There's a there's a sense, you know, that underlying sense of it was a joy to bring this together. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Janice, Janice Hallett, thank you so much for our time together. Um, again, I'm always surprised. At how conversations go, where where the words take us, and and it's mm -hmm. been such a delight. Just to wish you again all the very best uh, with Albert and Angels. Thank you for sharing Love My Reads with us and the books that you chose for that. Um, and I hope uh, at, at some point in in life's journey, we can actually meet uh, face to face. Well, in the same place, in person. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yes, I mean, it's been an absolute joy to come on here and, and talk about writing and books. And, you know, it's my favourite subject. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Janice. Bye for now. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.